Spain now for gosh nearly 20 years okay so quite a while and I do a variety of things I'm a MBSR teacher which means mindful based stress reduction okay and this is something that was created in the late 70s by a guy called John Kabat-Zinn I don't know if you know do you know anything about this now so he was a medical doctor who was working in America in a university hospital and he saw lots of patients that were basically being told that, like, that's it. We can't do anything more for you. And obviously, that's a really serious diagnosis. Now you've got chronically ill and you've now got to live with it. We can't do anything more for you medically. And at the time, it just so happened that he was also learning uh, Buddhist meditation. So he wondered whether maybe some of the practices that he was learning over there could actually be used make it secular, so take away all the Buddhism and the arming and everything else, and just help people sit with and be with the pain that they were suffering from. Because, of course, pain, physical pain, is also very much connected to mental pain as well. Just as we know that when we are very, very stressed, we also can make ourselves sick, we can make ourselves ill. And when we're ill or told that we're ill, that can also be very stressful. You know, if you're told like you've got cancer or something, you know, that creates a lot of stress in us. So he started this program, this MBSR program. And this has now become like the gold standard of meditation trainings. It's been used in the UK, where I come from. It's been used in hospitals, in prisons, in schools, in the workplace. They even had politicians doing the MBSR course, which is kind of incredible. Um, and it's an eight-week course that um, shows people how to meditate, but also explains a little bit like what I'm going to explain today, a little bit about stress and why we have it, of what use it is, okay, and how we can work with it. So this is why my introduction is called An Introduction to Mindfulness. Practical tips for surfing the waves, okay. I'll come back to why we have this wave image in a, in a moment. So we're going to have a little look at what is stress. So does, do you recognize this? I'm sorry, I don't know what it's called in French or Spanish, but fight or flight mechanism. So this is, for example, let me give you an example. Imagine that you are sitting in your car. Do you drive? Yes, no, okay. You're either driving or you're the passenger in the car, okay? and you've got children in the car, you're driving along, everyone's happy, everything's fantastic, and then suddenly a car swerves in front of you, okay? So close that you have to pull on the brakes, you have to pull to the side of the road, okay? Could have had a serious accident. In that moment, you have a reaction, right? You might even feel it a little bit now, no? That kind of, that reaction is called the fight and flight mechanism, okay? It's a movement in your body to do something. So it's either to fight, so that urge to suddenly have an argument with someone, maybe if they've been rude to you, or if something dangerous has just happened, you wanna say something to someone, or something dangerous is happening and you wanna get away from it as quickly as possible because it's really serious. It's life-threatening. There's a third one, which is freeze, which is when you just get stuck and you, you're so overwhelmed, you don't know what to do, okay? But today we're really going to look at these, these two. What happens in that moment? Well, it's a moment of stress. So what happens when you're stressed? What kind of things happen to you in your body? <laughs> Lots. Okay, tell me. What happens? Oh, in Espanol. Okay, yes. Yep. Hand sweating, maybe. Get really hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so legs are shaking. Yeah, okay. So we know this feeling of stress, right? It has a physical manifestation. Something happens in the body. And there's a good reason for it. 
because we are getting a little alarm system to say, telling us, a little alarm bell saying, there's a problem and we need to do something about it, okay? And what we need to do is one of these things. And this is because we have a very, very uh, old brain in a certain way, okay? So we don't, even though we're from the 21st century, what we've got in here is actually hasn't evolved since caveman times, okay? So a really, really long time ago, 14,000 years of this type of brain. And in that time, when we were cavemen and cave women, we really needed to know when there was a problem, okay? Because we, our life literally depended on it. So if there was a tiger, we needed to know so we could run away. Or if there was food, we needed to run towards it, okay? So we've got this situation where we've got a brain that is very, very uh, reactive, okay? And there is a reason why it's so reactive. Because if you think the uh, cave woman that was sitting outside the cave that heard a noise and said to the friends, do you think that's a tiger? And, uh, and they said, oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 no tiger. And it was a tiger? What happened? They got eaten, right? Their genes did not pass through the, to the next generation. Whilst the ones that sat by the cave and went, is that a tiger? I think it's a tiger. I'm just going to go inside anyway, okay? Their genes got passed down the generations. Now, if you think about that, all those people who were more fearful, who were more worried, they're the ones that eventually became us. So we have been, through a survival, through survival has created a situation where we are the ones that have got particularly alert brains to problems. Now this is good, because if you're stepping off the pavement and there's a bus coming, you don't want to have to think about it, right? You just want to get out of the way, and your body does it for you. You don't even think. Afterwards you realize, my God, I nearly got hit by a bus. But in the moment, it's just, an, it's just a, a reaction. It's a knee-jerk reaction, as we say, really super quick. And what's going on is, okay, this is like a little demonstration of the brain, okay? So here, this part here, is like the brain stem, okay? And this area here is like the area at the back of our heads here. And in there, there is something called the amygdala. This is the alarm bell for the fight and flight mechanism. So it's always looking for a problem. It's here in the limbic part of the brain. And then we've got this thing on top. This thing on top is the actual brain you normally see, okay? The gray matter, okay, the cortex. And the bit that's interesting for us is the front part. The front part is here, the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of the brain that has made us the top of the food chain, okay? The other animals, they've got this section, but we evolved another layer and we got this section of the brain, okay? This is <laughs> very scientific, but it's gonna explain in a minute why this is of interest. So this part of the brain here allows us to be creative, imaginative, forward planning, we're also aware of others and we have compassion for other people, okay? This is really useful because this part of the brain has allowed us to become great artists, great musicians, great planners of future events. This also can keep us up at three in the morning, no? Worrying, planning, imagining the worst terrible things that could happen. So it's a bit of a double-edged thing, okay? The dog is happier than we are because we can think, okay? But when we have a moment of stress, so when this area, when the amygdala at the back here says, boop, boop, there's a problem, this area literally gets taken offline. So we're not thinking anymore. We're just acting from a very, very basic part of our brain. So maybe you recognize this in a stressful, when you have a really stressful moment, like, I don't know, someone has just stolen your bag and you need to phone someone and then you're standing there with a mobile phone going, I can't think of the telephone number, right? I just can't think, or I can't think where my keys are. And you're having a total moment of panic. It's because literally your brain has been flipped out of the way to do something, to fight or to flight. But what you actually need to do in that moment is think. And this is very, very stressful because you're in a stress moment and you're stuck in there. You can't get out of it. So with mindfulness, the invitation is to try and find ways to keep this part of the brain here more often. Because we get triggered all the time. And it, we don't have tigers anymore, 
but we have emails, we have WhatsApp, we have 101 things. That person gives us a funny look and we're like, whoa, what's, we're ready. We're ready to do something, but what, have an argument? It's to be too reactive. So mindfulness is this, it's trying to notice it when this starts to go, whoa, I can feel the cortisol and the adrenaline making me want to do something. I'm going to take this back online. I'm going to calm down. So that car situation I was explaining, you know, you drive, you're driving along, someone swerves into you. In that moment, you have adrenaline and cortisol. You're ready to do something. You might even just want to shout at that person, you know, have a fight. Afterwards, when you've calmed down, when you've Taken a breath, this comes back online again. And you think, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe that person, I don't know, they had a pregnant woman in the car and they just had to get to the hospital quickly. Maybe there's other reasons. Now I'm using my imagination. Now I'm being creative. Now I'm thinking again. Now I'm not ready to just fight with that person. Okay? Because you can see how we have like sort of two modes. And we're more and more here. So they call this flipping your lid. This thing, this action, that is measured in milliseconds. That's how quickly it works. So like I say, when the bus comes and you're in the way, the minute it enters your retina, your eye, your body's ready to do something. If we stood there and went, I don't know, should I think about it for a bit? Should I get out of the way of the bus or not? It's no good, we're dead, we're, okay? We don't need to think in that moment, we need to act. This action of it coming back online is measured in seconds. So this is so quick. It's much quicker than the thinking brain. So that's how sometimes, you know, when you send an email and then you, <laughs> you know, and then afterwards you go, why did I do that? I should have thought a bit more about it. That's why, because you're working from this part, not from this part. So, mindfulness. Okay, so here we go. What's going on? in this picture here. What's the person thinking about on the nice walk? Everything, right? Yeah. The car, the house, the kids, that job, the email, the WhatsApp, the de 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 no. What's the dog thinking about? Exactly, the present moment. The dog is completely present. He's only got this part. Whilst we are in the present, but actually, not in the present. Actually, the mind doesn't really like to be in the present very often. It likes to spend a lot of time thinking about the past, okay? What could have happened, what I could have said differently, or it likes to go into the future, the planning, you know, the, the creative ideas you've got, then what am I gonna do with this person, this situation, my family and my job and my, you know, a lot of worry there, you know? So a lot of worrying about the future or a lot of what they call rehashing the past. So just constantly churning up what's going on. So do you recognize that as an image? Like you might be walking down the street, but actually you're like over here somewhere over there. Yeah, exactly. And you, all the time. And actually missing what the dog is seeing. Because what the dog is thinking about is like, oh, this is nice, right? Some trees, there's some sunshine. Okay, so I'm going to do a little, little experiment with you, okay, just to sort of look at various things. How the mind works. So the invitation here is just to notice what your mind does, okay, with this object. Because our mind is constantly sending out thoughts and information. And so the invitation here is to try and keep coming back to the exercise that we're doing. So, I'm going to invite you to have one of these objects. You are aliens who have just arrived on planet Earth, okay? So you know nothing about anything, about where we are, this, this, who I am, what these are, nothing at all. This is totally new for you. So, my lovely alien, I would like to invite you to take maybe two or three, if you like to. <laughs> and just put them in your hand, okay? There we go. Just take a couple. Perfect, okay. So, 
Welcome to Planet Earth. I would like to invite you to just have a look at these objects. Because you've never seen these before, have you? No. And you haven't. Because these are not like any other of these objects that you might have ever seen before. They're totally different. They're totally unique. So maybe just noticing how the mind already has started to work. <laughs> it's already thinking about which one it likes, maybe, which one it doesn't like, or hmm, that one looks nice, that one doesn't, maybe a bit of judgment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's totally normal. And um, yeah, if you want to, just choose one, okay? And even that, noticing how do you choose? How do you make a choice? What criteria? So when you're ready, choose one. And I would invite you just to have a really good look at it. Just explore it. What colors, what textures are here? How is it different from one side to the other? And just notice where your mind is. Maybe it's wandered off into thinking, what on earth am I doing? <laughs> I've got an hour and a half of this. <laughs> okay, so notice that and bring it back to exploring, really exploring it. Maybe like a child would explore it. Wow, what does it look like? What colors are here? Maybe you want to hold it up to the light. What do you notice now that you didn't notice before? How is it different? And maybe you'd like to experiment with smelling it. So, what does it smell like? Does it smell how you thought it might smell? Did you have some idea of what it might be like? And now it's different. And you may notice with smell, it takes you into remembering. Maybe you go into ex past experiences. Now when you're ready, maybe just holding it up to your ear. Does it make a sound? Hmm, maybe. <laughs> okay, and then noticing how you feel with that, yeah. Do you want to maybe just put it on your lips, just a second, put it on your lips, just feel that, because the lips are very sensitive. How does it feel now? And what has that done to your mouth? Has that changed your mouth at all, just by having that experience? Now I'm going to invite you in a moment to put it on your tongue, okay? No eating. <laughs> just place it on your tongue and just have that experience, having it in your mouth. What has that done to the body? Maybe to the belly, maybe to the, to the mouth. And when you're ready, I just invite you to very gently bite into it. And now what? And keep exploring the texture, and the flavor, the experience. It's all about the senses. And bit by bit, allowing it to go, and perhaps noticing when it's in the mouth, and then suddenly it's not there, and you can't feel it anymore. Where is that point? And bit by bit it's going. And then maybe the last little bit is gone. And noticing even now what's still here, even though it is gone. Okay, so you're welcome to have the other two if you want them or not. So, how was that experience? Yes. What did you notice? A lot of things that I would have not noticed before because that's so small I wouldn't choose it here. Yeah, so right. I, it and, um, I thought I didn't like them. Right before. Yeah. I think it's like, you know, when I was a child, I, I think I had them and I just thought, oh, I, I don't like them, I'll never have them again. Right. But I love them. 
Hooray! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. yeah. And lots of sensations. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, it's like the outside is very different from the inside. Yeah. When you chew it, I don't know, obviously outside is a bit like dry, but inside is very soft and sweet. Uh-huh. Yeah. And when you bit into it, was that what you were expecting? No, because I thought I was going to hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually liked it. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And looking at it as well, was that the, was did that surprise you in any way or? Yeah, I used to eat it a lot because I like it. But yeah. I still, when I eat it, I eat it with nuts because I saw the smell. Yeah. It's very different. Um, yeah. And when I look at it, it's like a, you can play with it and it's still yeah. hard and. Play with the color, with the transparency. Yeah. So, yeah, it's nice to experiment something you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a very different way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And did you notice your thoughts? What was going on with all the thoughts that came? Did you have a lot of thoughts mm. when you were doing it? You, I was concentrating. You were quite concentrated. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but also because I, I already read a little bit about mindfulness, so okay. this experience was on the well, something like that. Yeah. So I was thinking also on the book. I cannot uh -huh. stop thinking. So, yeah. So there we are, back, <laughs> back over here, no? But I was doing the experiments. Yeah. When I read the book, I read it and stopped. I okay. didn't experiment. You didn't do it, right? I so see. now it's okay. Yeah. Now you've tried. Yeah. So. It's uh, interesting, no? I mean, something as simple as that, as a raisin, can actually have a lot of depth to it. The sound, what it looks like. And, okay, what's interesting about this? A, we're noticing how much the mind wants to work and tell stories or investigate. You know, it's constantly working, isn't it? Or remembering things or wondering, when is it going to go into my mouth? Or when am I going to, when's this going to happen? What's it going to feel like? What's it going to smell like? Oh, it smells different. It's constantly talking. And also that doing something like mindful eating really enriches the experience. Because as you said, you, you eat raisins like this. No, we, just, we don't even think. And that's part of the problem is that we're not in that present moment. What, where are we when we're eating our food? We're over here, we're over here. And yet actually spending a bit of time being mindful over one experience, as simple as eating a raisin, can actually be very enriching, very, very interesting. Because as, as humans, we're always looking for something, aren't we? We're always looking for the next thing that's going to make us happy or it's going to fix things. And yet, actually, sometimes just coming back to what is happening in this very, very moment can be absolutely fascinating and really interesting. You, know, you feel like a child playing with that thing. It's, it's a new experience. So that is mindful eating. This is being with the moment. And it doesn't matter that the mind goes off. It's going to go off. It's just this experience of noticing that it's gone off and going, I make a choice now and I bring myself back. Because when we don't bring ourselves back, we've gone off into something called autopilot. And autopilot is really when you're just not, you're using your brain, but you're using it to be in the past or the future, to be worrying, okay, or judging, or in some way, and not actually just being with the present moment. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So, John Kabat-Zinn's uh, quote here, what mindfulness is. Paying attention in a particular way on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So yeah, we do spend time being in the present moment. It's not like we're always away. But quite often, this last line here, non-judgmentally, that's the tricky one, right? because we always want it slightly different from how it is. The food's okay, but I want it warmer. I wanted more of this, I wanted less of that. We have a judgmental mind that's constantly wanting something different from what we have. And that is also very stressful because if this is how we have it and we can't change it and we don't accept it, then we just get stuck in a loop of continual kind of complaining and unhappiness. So yes, here's the problem, not being in the present, 
rehashing the past, as I say, rehearsing the future, what I'm going to do, or we get stuck in aversion or attachment. Aversion, I don't want this, I don't want this to be how this is, I don't want this person to be the way they are, my partner, my mother, my father, my children, I don't want this situation in my life right now, or attachment. Oh, I had such a good time last week, I hope it's going to be the same. I want this boyfriend or partner to be as good as the other one, because that was really good and I want to hold on to that. Okay, And this, we talk about like a disparity monitor. So if you can imagine, there's like one line here, this is A, this is how things are. And down here, we've got another line, B, and that is how things, how we would like things to be. And if they're not the same, then we have in the middle here a problem. And this is very stressful because we're constantly wanting something that we don't have and not accepting what we actually do have. Yes, because we get stuck on this automatic pilot. So Harvard University did a study, reported that we are lost in thought 47% of the time. That's nearly half our lives, that our mind is off somewhere else. Now, how do they know that? They put an app on people's telephones, okay? And they pinged them twice a day and said, what are you doing right now? And what are you thinking about? And for 47% of the time over all the people, they were doing something else. So they were eating their meal, but they were thinking of that conversation with the boss. They were walking down the street, but they were thinking about that argument they had with their daughter two years ago. Okay, do you recognize that? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think sometimes 47% is actually a bit low. Yeah, I would have thought more. <laughs> Maybe people were like, mm. yeah. And in that, we have 80% of our thoughts are negative. Now, there's a reason for that, because going back to our caveman brains, we're constantly looking for a problem because it might save us from dying, okay? Except we're not really in that position anymore in this modern society. But our brain doesn't know that, our mind doesn't know that. So it's constantly looking for problems, okay? And that actually, we have this thing which is called a, a negativity bias. So, for example, your boss, imagine you have a boss, I don't know if you do, but your boss tells you, you're great, we really love with you, working with you, uh, your colleagues are really happy, that presentation you did last week was amazing. There's just this one thing that we need to talk about. Which one do you go home with? This doesn't really get mentioned. The one that gets taken home and worried about is this one. Because in our minds, in our caveman women minds, this is the one that is the danger. Because if this carries on and becomes a bigger problem and a bigger problem and a bigger problem, then I lose my job and then I don't have my house anymore and where are we going to live? And blah, 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 blah. It's a survival thing, right? We need to know the bad stuff so we can fix it. But the problem is that we miss all the good stuff. So all the great things that are in our lives, or all the praise that we get, or all the wonderful things that happen, the sun is out, all of this is really not useful for our minds because we don't care. This isn't going to help me survive. This is going to help me survive. So we concentrate on a lot of negative things because we're trying to fix them. But quite often, they can't be fixed. And quite often, they certainly can't be fixed at three in the morning when we're thinking and thinking and thinking about them. So it's a totally normal thing, okay? This is the good news. We got given this brain, it's evolved so far, but we are a little bit stuck with it, okay? It's looking for problems. And on top of that, 90% or more we've had before. So like I say, we're constantly going around on a washing machine cycle, no? Just stuck going over and over and over stuff. So this is all of us. It's not, just, it's not just you, it's not just you, it's all of us, okay, that have this problem. And it's like, the reason I put a radio there, it's because it's like a radio playing in the background all the time. Sometimes we notice it, and we hear it, sometimes we don't notice it, but it's playing. And that is also informing us how to be in our world, okay? If I'm having negative thoughts about myself, how does that make me be in the world with other people? Because you assume that those thoughts that are in your own head are in other people's heads. But maybe they're not. We don't know. 
Okay, so we're going to do a little practice. Okay, this is called a three-step breathing space. And the idea of this is to take us out of the automatic pilot. Okay, when we're stuck in it. And you can use it in different ways. So you can either use it just as a day-to-day -day practice. Okay, so when I run my course, we recommend that people do it three times a day and that they set when they're going to do it because it's really good to tune in to see how you actually are because we just carry on, don't we? We just go through life not, and every, until we really explode, we, don't, we, we just don't check in with ourselves and yet actually noticing how we are with our thoughts, with our emotions and how we are with our body sensations, i.e. tension, can really help us take us off that fight and flight mechanism where we're slightly stressed and up there all the time and bring us back down to actually, in this moment, everything is okay, more or less. So you can use it just during the day, but it's also very useful if you are having a moment where you've flipped your lid, okay? That you've suddenly going, oh my God, I'm really stressed or I'm really sad or I'm really frustrated or angry. Before I give it to everyone else, what can I do with it, okay? So if you'd like to just sit down, let me just grab a chair for a sec. Sit with your feet on the, on the floor. Okay. So, just to sit and uh, make sure your feet are nicely planted. Okay. And if, as much as you can, if you can sit away from the back, because in meditation, we are trying to not fall asleep, we're trying to fall awake. So the body posture is quite important because you're, you're giving a signal to your body to say, I'm here, I'm relaxed, but I'm trying to be in the present moment, okay? You want to just put your shoulders up for a second, let them drop, and again. <sighs> okay, and if you'd like to, perhaps just closing your eyes, or if not, just lowering your gaze, I'm just taking a moment to arrive. And so perhaps you might just notice the sounds in the room. The ticking of the clock, or the sounds next door. And now when you're ready, just noticing the thoughts that you have in your head. Just noticing the flavor of them. You might even want to label them, so maybe, oh, worry is here. And frustration is here. Boredom is here. Just whatever comes up. Just allowing thoughts to come and go. We don't need to try and stop them in any way. And as much as we can, not even judging them. They're just thoughts. They just come up. We can just let them be. And now moving into the world of emotions. And just noticing how you feel. Perhaps just asking yourself, how do I feel right now? And again, just giving them a name and letting them go. Whatever comes up is fine. You don't need things to be different from what is happening in the present moment. Whatever that is. And now perhaps, if there's one particularly strong emotion, it may have an echo in the body. 
So perhaps just noticing if there's any tension anywhere in the body that's related to that emotion, that feeling. Again, without needing to change it. Just exploring that body sensation. So this is a wide awareness. Now we're going to gather this awareness to a specific thing, to our breath. So when you're ready, just noticing your breath moving in and out of the body. Again, no need to change it in any way. Just getting really interested in how it is. And perhaps noticing where it is in the body. Is it in the belly? chest, or perhaps in the nostrils. And just being with it, following the cycle, it might help to say to yourself, so quietly, in your own mind's eye, breathing in, breathing out. And now when you're ready, opening the awareness again to include the whole body sitting here. So noticing the feet, the ankles, the knees, the legs, the hands, the arms, and up through the body, the hips, the waist, the belly, the chest, and also the lower back, the middle back, and the upper back, up through the shoulders, the neck, the jaw, the face, the scalp. So sitting here with the sensations in the body, with the thoughts coming and going, Emotions coming and going, and the sounds around us. And then when you're ready, just opening your eyes, and just perhaps having a little stretch. I just invite you to stand up for a moment because we've been sitting for a while. So if you want to stand up and just yeah, have a little stretch, but we, even when you're stretching, staying with the body sensations, okay? Because the mind will want to wander off. So just doing whatever it is that you feel like you need to do right now, just to stretch. Up your little rub of the head, but as much as you can, staying with the body. Noticing the mind wandering off, just inviting it to come back to this present moment. Just giving the legs a bit of a move as well before we sit down. Keeping with the body sensations. Okay, you can sit down. So, how was that? <laughs> Relaxing. Uh huh. You feel like something is yeah. dropped. Uh huh. Okay. And that was a longer version. You can do a shorter version as well. So, did you notice your thoughts mm -hmm. coming and going? Yes. And were you able to label them in some way? Mostly negative. There was one good one, but um, then actually, yeah, negative. Okay. So practicing that being in the present moment, non-judgmentally, it's like, oh, look, I'm having negative thoughts. Oh, that's interesting. 
rather than, oh my God, I'm having negative thoughts, what's wrong with me, you know? Or that negative thought, I've got to go with it, which is our normal automatic pilot. The invitation in the meditation is to watch. Because then when you start to watch the thoughts and the emotions, and even the body sensations, you realize that you aren't those things. Because you're over here, the observer, watching what is happening. And this is really key. Because we spend a lot of our time believing our thoughts and our emotions, and we get very, very involved in our body sensations. Now I've got this shoulder, it really hurts, I'm telling my story about it, what's wrong with me, I'm stressed, and blah, 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 blah. But actually, we can just sit and watch them. And that's very calming, because it's like, well, I'm not, it's not me. These things are just coming, they're just happening to me, rather than I'm in them. And this is me, and this is my story that's always going to be the same. So I think when we're in a negative place, the, it's so frustrating, you know, the, the continual me. No, wherever I go, I take me with me, and this always happens, and it's really exhausting. Yeah. What's happening to me right now, that's where I see most moments, is um, I was praying to just let the start to go to school but um, I was praying to that when I'm spelling si. Si, si. Si, si. Um, uh, cada, intentando cada cosa la voy relacionando con algo más ¿no? y entonces uh -huh. con la, el de, 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 de persona si. Yeah, 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 yeah. Claro. Sí. Yeah, it's exhausting. So, absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Wow. Mucha información. Entonces, so, absolutely, that sometimes, I mean, I've been meditating for a long time, but sometimes I sit down, there's a whole story in there, you know? So what do you do with it? You allow it. You don't try and stop it. Because we spend a lot of our lives, no, I don't want this. I don't want this. And yet it's still here. So instead, meditation is a, is a very different way of looking at dealing with life. And in the meditation, it's like a little science uh, laboratory. It's like, can I sit here and allow whatever comes up? So if a thousand thoughts come up, that's okay. I can allow them, but I can watch them. And the labeling is really useful because it's like, oh, look at me, I'm thinking, I'm remembering my friend. I'm, my friend who does them, but I'm remembering. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, look, and now I'm having a thought about the clock. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, and now I'm... And there's a trick. That if you do meditation again, there's a trick. Ask yourself, hmm, I wonder what my next thought will be. I wonder what my next thought will be, or what will my next thought be? And that quite often, the brain goes, oh, uh, I haven't got anything to say now. It's really interesting. It's like a game. So it's like they say it's a bit like a, you know, like a cat waiting for the mouse to come out of a hole. But you just sit there and go, come on. Let's have a thought. Come on, come on. And the mind just goes, I don't, I don't. And then at some point you'll go, oh, I'm doing really well. I haven't thought. Ah, that's a thought. <laughs> okay. It's a constant, constant game. Okay. But we're not trying to stop thoughts. We're not trying to have no thoughts. We're trying to practice with whatever is coming up in the present moment and allowing it to be. Because just in a meditation, so in life, no? I don't want this. Hmm, here I am trying to stop things, say I don't want something. It's already happening. Can I just be with it in some way? Can I accept it in some way? Okay. So yes, it comes to this. What mindfulness isn't? Relaxation, although this may happen. Okay? So we're not sitting down trying to relax. Because then you're setting yourself up for another thing you're aiming to do. 
And meditation is an aimless activity. There is no aim. So we spend a lot of time in our lives doing, no? Doing, doing, doing. Either physically doing or mentally doing, like wanting to get the to-do list and sorting that out and thinking about this and all of that. When we sit and meditate, it's an opportunity to do nothing but be. Yeah, I know. There's a kind of mix, isn't there? So meditation, really, I would say, is sitting down and doing a, a formal, what they call a formal practice. So sitting down for, like we've just done now, five minutes, could be one minute, could be half an hour, but it's, it's choosing to take yourself maybe away and being quiet. Being mindful, well, you're being mindful in the meditation because mindfulness is about attention. It's where you're putting your attention. But we also can be mindful eating food. We can also be mindful walking. We can be mindful having a shower. So it's training the attention. So yes, they get kind of mixed together. It's because they are linked, obviously. But I would say that meditation is definitely the formal practice of sitting down in some way. Okay. Um, so yes, no aim, an aimless thing. Okay, we just sit and we see what happens in every moment. What's happening now? What's happening now? What's happening now? But as you've experienced, it can sometimes, not for you, but for you, it was relaxing because there's some kind of like ah, letting go. And the breathing is very relaxing because when we get stressed, if we're really stressed, the breath all goes up here. No, oh God, I can't cope. <laughs> this. And actually, we can tell the body that everything is okay by literally breathing more deeply. Because when we're doing this, we're like relaxing ourselves. We're telling this area here, it's okay, it's okay, I've got it. It's, there's no need to panic. There's no problem here. I see that there's a little problem, but I have got it. It's okay. So the breathing is really, really very, very useful. It's not about having thoughts, okay? You're going to have thoughts. They, ha they say we have between 85,000 and 125,000 thoughts every day. So, of course, some of them are going to arrive in the middle of a meditation. So the practice is not to get rid of the thoughts. The practice is that you go off, oh, I'm thinking about dinner. Oh, I've noticed. Come back. Uh, that's as good. Oh, no, I'm thinking now about uh, taking the dog for a walk. Oh, I've noticed. I'm coming back. Because that's what we're doing in life. Oh, look, I'm starting to get annoyed. I'm starting to get... Oh, no, I'm making another choice. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And the more times you do it, the better you get at it. So, like when you were children, right, you couldn't walk, you couldn't talk, you couldn't read, you couldn't write. How did you get to do those things? You practiced, no? Over and over, slowly, you practiced and practiced until eventually, one day, you could do them. The same with what's going on in here, okay? That bit by bit, we've learned to practice to have negative thoughts, to feel stressed, to maybe get angry or to get sad, those triggers, and the more and more we practice them, the better we get at it. So if we're good at negative talk to ourselves, we are like experts because we've been doing it for years and years and years. But the good thing is that our minds actually help us, okay? So the, the thing you put your attention on, you get good at. So if you start to put your mind's attention on something else, your mind literally starts to change. There's a thing called neuroplasticity, which means that what you pay attention to uh, changes the structure of your brain allowing you to get better at it. So if you wanted to play the piano right now, I don't know if you play the piano, but imagine you play, can't play the piano. Really, at the beginning, you can't do it. But then the mind goes, oh, look, we're trying to hand-to-eye coordination would be really good. And sections of the brain will connect together to allow you to get good at this new thing that you need to do. The same thing happens in meditation. The more time you sit down, being kind to yourself, bringing yourself back to the present moment, the better you get at it because the mind literally makes connections in the brain to allow you to get better at it. So, for example, people who have been doing this for years and years, like Tibetan monks, when they look at their brains, 
in an MRI scan, they can see there are areas, particularly in the prefrontal cortex area, that have literally got thicker. They're even, they're bigger than other people's because they have meditated so often with so much loving kindness, they have created this area that they are like, they are like super powered with these areas. They, it, and it's their automatic, there's no negative thinking in there. It's got less and less and less. And what's got there instead is more and more being in the present moment, being with what is, accepting what is happening, and being kind to oneself and being kind to other people. So there is a training that you can do. So we got stuck with this caveman brain, and it's evolved so far, and now we know that. And now we can actually do something to help ourselves to move away from the negative thoughts and the emotions and to be more positive and to accept a little bit more what's happening in our lives. The final thing that's important to say about mindfulness is it's not about attaining some spiritual state like this dog, okay? That when John Kabat-Zinn created the, uh, the course that I teach, he went, right, we need to get rid of all the Buddhism, all the arming, because people are going to get turned off by that, or they're already religious and they don't feel like, you know, Catholicism and Buddhism is going to work, whatever. So it's completely, completely secular. Okay. So I want to just do a little exercise with you. What you resist persists. So again, here's the dog just thinking about his bone, whilst here we are saying who, what, where, what, how much, blah, blah, thinking, 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 thinking. So I would like you to think of perhaps something that's been stressful in the last week. Can you think of something that's been a stressful event, a thing that has happened? Nothing too big, but something big enough. Yes. Can you tell me? <laughs> if you feel like you want to share it, maybe you don't. It's part of the big. That's, okay. Um, I'm actually looking for a job. Okay. Uh, well, it's uh, quite long way. Okay. But maybe uh, now I need it. Yes, so yes. So I'm, I'm okay. To, to you work. need to work. So I'm quite stressed. Okay. Like okay. You need to work because you're... Uh, yeah, okay. That's a good one. And did something specific happen this week? Right, you need to get a job, yeah, no? Yeah. Okay, perfect, okay, that's, that's good. Thank you very much for sharing that. And for yours, what was yours? Uh, just moved in here. Right. So, um, everything's going well so yeah. far, so I'm very happy, but obviously you know, I'm new, I need time to learn Spanish. Um, yeah, it's just a bit overwhelming because I'm here, it's just all new. So I don't know anyone. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to stand up for a moment, if you don't mind, just here. And I'm just going to, excuse me a minute, I'm just going to steal some pillows. Okay. Okay. So this is what our mind does. Okay. So can I just give you this pillow? This is, um, I've just arrived here. I've just arrived here, okay? Yeah. I've just arrived here and I need to get some things done, okay? So, I've just arrived here, I need to get some things done. Mm -hmm. Now tell me what's stressful about that or what's happening, what's the story around that? Right, um, I'd say it's changes. So I know changes are good, yeah. but always a bit scary. So I've got a flat, I've got a job okay um but yeah as i said i need to learn the language because, okay yeah okay so you're worrying that you need to learn the language yes. no and that's going to take a while okay so here's the worry for i've got to learn the language okay, okay. what else what are, what are the other thoughts or emotions or feelings how does that make you feel mm, well i normally i don't know i like meeting people i'm very you know, um, I like socialising okay. and that I can't do now. So. Okay, so there's no social life, which is a bit, exactly. yeah. a bit lonely? Yeah. Okay, it's a bit lonely. How do you feel feeling lonely? Uh, 
<laughs> a bit heavy. <laughs> a bit heavy. Okay. How does that feel maybe in your body? Well, in the chest, definitely. Like a bit like... A bit tight in the yeah. chest. Okay, here's tightness in the chest. Okay. Like... Uh, um, tension. Okay. Tension in the chest. Any other thoughts about tension in the chest? For having to get to ju having to get learn the language. What's a thought that might be in all of this? Right. There is also another thing. Um, I just broke up with someone. Okay. And he's Spanish, but I met him in England back in England because we were living in England. Okay. Um, we broke up. Now I'm here. He's still in England, and I'm trying to figure out if we should go back together or not because this is my new experience. Okay, should, this, should you be having this new experience, maybe you by should myself, be... No, I mean, by myself here and start yeah. something afresh or just, you know... Yeah, so decisions to be made, which yes. is very stressful. Okay, so decisions to be made. Here you are. Let's put that under there. Okay, now, how do you feel? Well, it feels like I can't hold much no. <laughs> anymore. Maybe a bit overwhelming, yeah. no? Okay, so my invitation for you is to keep hold of the very first cushion, which is, I'm new here and let go of all the other ones, if you can. Just let them drop. One. But I keep this one. Yeah, okay. How do you feel now? Good. You could just be here, right? You could just be new yeah. without the story around it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so, I'll tell you what, let's just put them on the floor there because they're quite good. So here we go, this is what we do. We have an event or a situation, okay, a thing. This could be, I need to get to work. But then from there, we start to tell ourselves stories. No, well, and if I don't get the job, what am I going to do in the flat? And then I've got this other situation. How am I going to deal with that? And then I've got a headache because of it. But then I don't want a headache because I've got to get on with the, th you know what I mean? It's just going, it's going round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And, round. and that actually, we could just stop with the, the first part, the event, the thing that is happening in the present moment. However, we get stuck with this equation, okay? So A is the event, the thing that is happening. B is our perception, so it's how we see it. And that then affects our experience. So the story could just be, I need to get a job. The story could be, I'm, I'm just here, I'm new but we connect it to so many things, and that's stressful. Now, when you look at the percentages here, 10% of our experience, of our 100% experience, is the event. The rest of it is how we look at it. Would you agree with that? And this depends very much on how we're feeling as well. Like, if we're in a really, really good mood, and then someone is a bit rude to us, for example, just on a smaller thing, we're like, boop. No, but if we are feeling depressed or sad or stressed already, and then someone is rude to us, suddenly that becomes like a really big story. And yet the event hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is our way of looking at it. And that affects our experience. Now we often forget that there's this bit here. We think, oh, that thing's happened. Great, this is how I feel now. But actually, it's up to us how we experience it. Okay, how we perceive it. And the good news is, this is the bit that we can work with. We can't work with that. That's always going to happen. These things, these things in life are always going to happen. But it doesn't always have to be the same experience. That we can work on this section here. Because we have storytelling minds. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little, a little experiment with you, okay? So... Um, Actually, I'm going to do this one. Susie on the bus. So you just want to just close your eyes for two seconds, okay? So it's just a little, it's just a, using your imagination. Okay. So I want you to imagine there is somebody called Susie and she is sitting on the bus. So just think to yourself, what does she look like? What's she wearing? How old is she? Where is she going? Okay, so maybe you get a picture, maybe not. Susie is sitting on the bus and she's got a teddy bear in her lap. 
a teddy bear, like a little, uh, what do they call it? Pel <laughs> okay, so what does she look like? How old is she? What's she wearing? Where's she going? What's her story? So Susie is sitting on the bus. She's got her teddy bear. And she's excited because she's going to give it to her grandson. Okay, so what does she look like? What is she wearing? How old is she? Susie is sitting on the bus. She's got her teddy bear in her lap. She's excited about giving it to her grandson. But she is also very tired because she just won the swimming competition. Okay. How old is she? What does she look like? Etc. Okay, so open your eyes. What happened? What happened there with the picture of Susie? Did she stay the same? No. No. How was she? Twenty years old-ish. Right. Then she was um, little girl. Uh huh. Right. Then she just looked like my grandmother. Okay. And then about the swimming thing, she was not my grandmother anymore. So yeah, it just like changed. Just went. Yeah. Okay. She changed a lot. Okay. Did you have to think a lot about how no. she was going to look? No. Did your mind just fill in the blanks? Yeah. The same, yes? No, or I'm uh uh claro. uh okay. Y fácil, ¿no? Para, para pensar en esto, ¿no? No tienes que trabajar mucho. You don't have to work hard to, 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 to imagine. Yeah. So this is it. Our minds, with a tiny, tiny piece of information, creates a whole story, no? The clothes that they're wearing, how old they are, where they're going. So this is this part of the brain thinking again, no? The creative part of our brain. It's amazing that we th if we think we're not creative people, we're unbelievably creative. We just have the name Susie on the bus and we're already running. We've already got a story. We could write a book about Susie and where she's going, right? So this is one thing that's really interesting, like we have so much creative power. But the other thing is that our mind is constantly trying to fill in the blanks. Okay, we don't know all the information, but we want to fill it with information. And we want to fill it because then we know, because if we know, then we can fix it if it's a problem. And this is a problem for us, because quite often there isn't really a problem, but we think there might be. And when the mind holds on to the, well, there might be, then off it goes into all of this. Okay? This could be good, bad, or neutral. We don't know. But because of our negativity bias, we kind of tend to go into the negative area with it. So again, it's like, can we train our attention in some other way to not constantly go down the, the worst case scenario? Because you are not your thoughts. We talked a little bit about this already. Thoughts are just clouds that come and go. Okay, so we're going to do another little exercise now, which is a meditation on thoughts. Okay, so if you want to just sit back down again in that sort of meditation position. So sitting upright. Now I warn you now, you are going to think a lot. Okay, your head. Don't worry, it's fine. They're allowed, they're welcome, okay? They're welcome, the thoughts. They're not trying to be pushed away. So we're just going to arrive in the present moment, okay? Maybe close your eyes or lower your gaze. And we talk about in meditation having an anchor. Now an anchor is something that you can just come back to to help you stay in the present moment. It can be your feet. So just noticing how your feet are right now. They don't need to be any different from how they are, but just noticing what they feel like. Hot, cold, tingly, 
or maybe nothing at all. Everything is fine. Okay, and that can be your anchor. So when your mind wanders off, you can also bring yourself back to your feet. Or it can be your breath. So now just noticing your breath. Moving in and out of your body. Perhaps in the chest area or the belly. Okay. And then when you notice that a thought comes into your mind, just allow it to be there. Perhaps you say, hello thought, to yourself. And come back again to the anchor, so the breath or the feet. So we're just going to practice that, okay? Trying to stay with our anchors. When the mind wanders off, noticing, saying hello thought, and then just coming back again. Mind may be pulled by thoughts, listening to sounds. And sounds can just come and go. And you can just make a choice. Do I want to stay with my thoughts or do I want to come back to the present moment? Back to myself. Back to my breath. Back to my feet. It may be useful to think of thoughts like clouds. So our mind is like the sky, wide, open, blue. And every so often a thought will come across it. And they may be small, little clouds, or they may be big, storm clouds. You can just sit here and watch them coming and going. And choosing to come back to the present moment again. Back to the feet or back to the breath. It may be useful to imagine you're sitting in a cinema and your mind is like the screen. And so every so often a thought, like an image, comes onto the screen. And you're just sitting there watching. allowing things to come and go. Just noticing. That's all. There's no right or wrong. And then you can come back to the breath again. Now I just invite you to take a very deep breath in and breathing out, just letting go. And again, breathing in and breathing out slowly. One last time, breathing in and breathing out. Okay.
And again, when you're ready, just listen to the sound. Bring some movement to the body, maybe the fingers, the feet, rolling the shoulders. Okay. So how is that? Interesting. <coughs> lots of thoughts. Yeah. The thing is, it's a good thing to have lots of thoughts. Because every time you have a thought, it's an opportunity to wake up and bring yourself back. So in a meditation, if you go away 50 times, that's 50 times you wake up and bring yourself back. So that's to be celebrated. Because what you're doing there is you're exercising your mindfulness muscle. So like when you go to the gym, if you don't pick the weights up, you can't get this muscle any bigger. You need something to pick up. You need something to work with. And in this case, the thoughts are the thing that you work with. Okay, good. Now I have to do this 50 times because this is what I'm creating, this new muscle, this new way of being with myself. So it's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with the thoughts, okay? It's really important. Yeah. It's what to practice with. It's like uh, we practice with um, being patient. But how can we learn to be patient if there isn't impatience? We need impatience, moments of impatience, to notice, ah, look, I've gone into impatience. Now I have an opportunity to practice patience. Oh, look, I'm really judgmental. I'm really, really, really judgmental with myself or with someone else. Perfect opportunity to let that go. Perfect opportunity to practice non-judgment. So we can't do the thing we need to do without the opposite. So when the opposite turns up, hooray, it's time to go to the gym. <laughs> yeah. How was that for you? Yes, yeah, very good. Yeah. Managed, I think, to come back. Um, yeah. yeah. It's an eternal practice. Mm. I don't think anyone who meditates has no thoughts. Not for a consistent amount of time. And actually, that's not the aim. It really, really isn't. The aim is the practice, the bringing back, the coming back, the coming back. And the coming back with kindness. Because that's very important, that inner voice, that's what we're training. Because if we have an inner voice that's going, oh, God, you're such an idiot, you can't do this meditation. What's wrong with you? That's the voice we're taking out into the world with us as well, no? Every time we get something wrong. What we're training is a voice that says, oh, look at you, you just went off again. That's okay, don't worry. It's fine. Come back. Because that's the voice we're trying to practice with ourselves in real life. That we're kinder to ourselves in some way. Okay. Because pain is inevitable. Pain is physical pain, emotional pain, painful thoughts, painful events. But the suffering or the stress, so Buddhists call it suffering, we call it stress, is optional. This is always going to happen. This, we can do something about. Okay. Just very quickly, I'm aware we've got five minutes, but so we talked a little bit about these. Everyday mindfulness. So some things you can just do now. Labeling. So we did this a little bit already. Stopping the alarm bell. So noticing there is anger here and saying to yourself, not, oh, I'm angry again, but there is anger here. Okay, because it's like a thing that's passing in front of you. It's not like you're in it. Or there is tiredness here. A lot of stress just comes from being tired. And we don't even notice it. So if we actually say to ourselves, there is tiredness here. It's kind of amazing. It has an effect. It's like, I know alarm bell is a problem. It's called being tired. But don't worry, I'm not going to get eaten by a tiger. All right. I've seen it. I've acknowledged it. And I can let it go. And quite often that kind of releases the tiredness a little bit. Discomfort in any way. Discomfort, pain in the shoulder, discomfort with how I'm feeling right now, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. Just acknowledging it, just saying there is discomfort here. Again, just calms the alarm system a little bit. 
90 second flush, yeah. So there's a woman called uh, Julie Bolt who wrote a great book. And one of the things in her bo book is we have a flush of emotions and it lasts 90 seconds. So someone says something to us and we go, Bwah! okay, fight and flight. And if we didn't pick it up with this part of the brain, if we could just let it go, oh, look, there's anger here. In 90 seconds, it would have gone. But because we pick it up and think about it, do all of this, it stays with us and stays with us and can stay with us for years. But actually, the next time you have a moment of a big emotion, practice that. Notice it. Label it and allow it to be. Don't try and change it. You can try and see if you can feel it in the body. God, I feel real anger now. It's here, or it's, it's in my stomach, or stress is here. It's really making me churn. I've got this pain from my shoulder. Just notice it and be with it without trying to change it in any way. It's this leaning into it, allowing it, rather than trying to push it away all the time. Taking in the good. So we talked about the negativity bias. You know, this one here, this, 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 this was all good, and then this one was not so good. So try and take in the good. When you walk out of this room, maybe when you walk down the street, mindfully walk, slowly walk. Notice the good things. The sun is shining. It's a nice day today. I've got nice things coming up. Whatever you can find. It doesn't have to be big things. Small things, like the sun is out, is big. Choose calm moments, yeah. Because the imagination can't tell the difference between real danger and make-believe. Okay, kiss you saw. When we read on Facebook, some terrible thing has happened. We go into the fight and flight mechanism a little bit, no? We have this, oh God, have you seen? And then you tell someone else, and I know, and then woo, and then they're going. It's happening, we're, we're sparking each other, okay? We keep telling each other stories of all the terrible things that are happening in the world. We feel it all the time. Or if we've had a very stressful day at work, perhaps, or just a very stressful day, and then we go home and we go, I need to relax. I will put on a Hollywood film that is full of people being shot and someone being chased. We go through it, right? We're with them. We can't tell the difference. Our body cannot tell the difference between a real danger, someone really over there with a gun, or a man on a television screen with a gun. Because we get involved, don't we? That's why we like Hollywood movies, because we, we go through the whole process. We like the adrenaline rush. But also, it's not very good for us, because we're constantly in the adrenaline rush. Now, we've had a stressful day, and then I'm going to watch a television program, which is really stressful, and then I'm going to look at Facebook, and that's quite stressful. We never have these calm moments. And so meditation is one way to have calm moments, because we always try and fill our moments, no? Oh, I've got five minutes, I'm just getting my phone out. Because there's more, of, more, more information, more information. Maybe the next time you have five minutes, you're sitting waiting for someone in a cafe, try doing the, the uh, three-step breathing stay, space. Look at your thoughts, look at your emotions, look at your body sensations. Breathe. Drink your coffee slowly, taste it, savor it. These things all bring you into the present moment. These are the calm moments to recuperate from all the, the, the peaking, okay? Gratitude, same idea. Start the day, end the day with a bit of like, what, what's good in my life? Take a moment to connect with what's happening. So eating, showering, brushing your teeth. Brushing your teeth is a good one because we do this, right? And we're already thinking about all the things we've got to do that day. What about coming to the senses, tasting the, t the toothpaste? Feeling the sensation, listening to it, bring ourselves back. All oh, my mind's wandered, bring myself back. All oh, my mind's wandered, bring myself back. All little tiny trainings that you can do. Change your physicality. Okay, if you're on computer, you might notice you do a bit of this. This image is of a depressed person, right? My life is going wrong. So bringing yourself into a more physically open way. You're opening up, you're able to breathe better, and it makes you feel better. One I want to do with you right now is I just want you to look up and smile. Okay? Just look up and smile. Keep going. <sighs> Keep going. Even if you don't feel like smiling, just smile away. Okay. Really smile. Teeth. Everything. Ah! Oh, hello! Yay! Okay. Now come down. How does that make you feel? It has a slight effect, right? 
Just as when we're feeling sad, this shows on our face. When we change it round and we put a smile on our face and do that just for two seconds, it sends the endorphins through the body that everything's kind of okay. Because usually in the present moment, everything is okay. It's just this past and this future that we worry about. In the present moment, it's actually okay. That's a really useful one when you feel yourself going right into one, you know? Even though you don't feel it, it can just help you lift your mood a little bit. Yeah, look up and smile. And the last one I want to end with is this. Give yourselves a hug. Okay, so everybody, just give yourselves a hug. Because again, our mind is so amazing but it can't really tell the difference between someone giving you a hug, which is very important. We do it to our children. We do it with our partners. We do it with our loved ones, our friends. We do it for a reason. It's a connection. It makes something called oxytocin flow. It's the chemical that is created in our body to make us have connections. So if you hold a baby in your arms, the oxytocin is flowing. It makes you connect with that baby. It takes about 20 seconds for the oxytocin to flow to make you feel better. And if this feels a little inappropriate in the middle of a business meeting, <laughs> okay, try this. Just giving your hand a little rub. Just you would, it's about supporting yourself, okay? I'm having a bit of a wobble. I'm feeling a bit emotional right now, a little bit stressed. It's not, it's not a uh, hand, it's not that. It's a I'm looking after you hand. I'm with you, hand, and that can help as well. Okay, so there we go, ladies. We've talked about this already, neurons. What we practice is what we get good at. Because, as John Kabat-Zinn says, you can't stop the waves. You can't stop this, but you can learn to surf. You can choose to do something different. Okay, so there we go. Thank you all very much. Thank you.